Carnegie Endowment during the middle of World War II called the League of Nations the great experiment. And the great experiment of having an international serv civil service found its way into Charter Article 101, which calls for securing the highest standards of efficiency, competence, and integrity. Well, the UN's second um, Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, was the most notable spokesman for this concept. And his speech at Oxford shortly before his death in 1961 is frequently cited. There's a wonderful passage in the middle of it in which he spells out, and I quote, that any erosion or abandonment of the international civil service might, if accepted by member nations, well prove to be the Munich of international cooperation. Hammerschild fervently believed that officials could go beyond national interest to find a common good symbolized by the light colored blue passport, which was distinct from the narrow interests of the countries that issued their national passports. Well, obviously setting aside senior positions or junior positions for officials who are approved by their home countries belies that integrity. Governments seek to ensure that their own interests are defended within secretariats. Several of them, even in the past and at current, rely on officials for intelligence. From the outset, for example, the fact that the five permanent members got to name, select, and place in jobs nationals to fill posts in, this, in the uh, cabinet illustrates that fact. And then during the 1950s and 60s, decolonization, 100 new states, they all clamored for their quota, their share of the booty. Um, the result, frankly, has been downplaying competence and exaggerating national origins as the main criterion for recruitment and promotion. Over the years, efforts to improve gender balance and age discrimination have led to other kinds of quotas. Virtually all positions above the director level, and sometimes way below, are vetted and the object of active campaigns by government, including, of course, the already rewarded permanent five. Well, how many people am I talking about? There were 500 at Lake that first year after Lake's success. Today, there are 55,000 in the UN proper and the agencies created by the GA, another 20,000 in specialized agencies, probably 120,000 this year in peacekeeping operations, another 15,000 in the Bretton Woods institutions. So there's been a huge increase, but obviously not very much in relationship to the nature of the problems that we face. Well, why do I emphasize this topic? Because for me, actually, and this, I think you're correct, Christopher, I haven't lost this notion of agencies, that individuals matter for both good and for ill. The second UN does, in my view, or could in many ways, carry, not carry out marching orders from governments. And here I disagree, actually, with a sentence Roger that I found. And Roger gave this lecture last year, Roger Coate, Don Puchala in 1995. And in a, in a book they recently wrote, the Curie, they dismissed the notion that the United Nations is an autonomous actor in world affairs that can and does take action independent of the will and wishes of member governments. Of course, this is true for resolutions and political decisions, but it's not true for much of what goes on. UN officials present ideas, tackle problems, debate them informally and formally with governments, take initiatives, advocate for change, turn decisions into programs, implement experiments in the field. They monitor progress, report to national officials and politicians, give particular spins to issues. I think that there's considerably more room for creativity and initiative than we commonly think. I don't think any of this should surprise us. It would be a strange and impotent national civil service that took no initiative, showed no leadership, simply awaited instructions from on top. In my view, UN officials sometimes are no different, and they should be no different on most occasions. Well, this brings me to the problems. What's happened? I think any way you cut this, whether it's recruitment, composition, rewards, retention, performance, international civil servants are now part of what ails the organization. Many of us in this room, Brian Urquhart, for example, have concentrated on 
What do we do to change the election process for the secretaries general, heads of agencies? But for me, the problems go much deeper. The, and the quality and the work of the secretariats are something that we can do something about, or a secretary general. Leakage, so-called, to Jordan and Turkey are one thing. But that's not what interests me. What interests me here is the sloppy management of this politically visible and crucial assignment that was so botched that tarnished the organization's reputation. So while Volcker and the, the press pay attention to the ethically improper uh, activities, including by Anand San Kojo, what I find most disconcerting is the inattentive management system that was outmoded, inept, and quite out of its depth in administering a program of this size and complexity. Quite simply, they didn't have the technology or the people to do a good job. Or let's look at women in the organization. The pace of change has been, in my view, nothing short of glacial. At the beginning of the 21st century, they are ex not excluded, but minimalized in both the trenches and the bureaucracy. The beginning of this year, of the troops that are in UN operations, not quite 2% uh, consist of women. If you look at the secretariat as a whole, about a third, including the general service categories, are uh, women. It's only at the entry level, the P1 level, that there is anything approaching something like gender balance. And in the higher categories and above, women are less than a quarter. And at the, the area where it would be easiest to do something, namely the, the uh, naming of special representative, beginning this year, two of 26 were women. Well, is the human rights arena any different? And for me, the human rights arena would be the one where the UN should shine. The UN is the set standards and therefore the standard bearer uh, should be implementing the, or leading the implementation of the standards that it sets. You don't have to look much beyond the, um, the trading money for food and sex in a whole series of peacekeeping operations. There have been some studies, there have been some efforts, but, for, and the Secretary General supposedly implemented a zero tolerance policy but the boys will be boys, because they mainly are, um, continues. Second, uh, for me, what's even more disconcerting is the lack of support for people at the top who run risks and stick out their necks. They're caught at this vortex of sovereignty and human rights. So if you look closely at Jan Pronk, who appeared, who is the gave the keynote at our meeting in The Hague a number of years ago. Jan Pronk um, was the special rep watching the slow motion uh, genocide in Darfur. In then as now, governments are dragging their feet. He chose to speak out and he chose to put some statements on his own personal blog. The government made him persona non grata and his reward was the Secretary General calling him home before even the government had thrown him out. Now, once again, I don't think this should imply that there haven't been numerous examples of people, including a couple in this room, who haven't acted differently. But what I think is peculiar is the weight of the shackles of political correctness that circumscribes activities in the human rights arena. This is a major shortcoming. Well, what about sustainable development? And I, the thing is, I've got lots of stories. These are, I'm not cherry-picking examples. The most recent and egregious one was the Secretary General's naming the new head of the Department of Economic and Social Affairs. The choice was a Chinese diplomat who had started out life as a translator and has no exposure, previous exposure to development thinking and practice. This is not atypical. The, the, the deputy who actually was at a Nikits meeting as well, uh, was chosen for no other reason, frankly, than that she's a Tanzanian Muslim woman. This is not exceptional. The UK and US uh, undersecretaries general were chosen because uh, they may be trained diplomats. They had no knowledge of what they were working on, but they were close to George Bush and Tony Blair when they were, they were nominated.